Welcome back, everybody, to The Opportunistic Trader. It is December 20th, and we're joined by Bryn Kelly of The Fundamental Angle and Mike Korn. Uh, they've been joining us regularly uh, to discuss natural gas, crude, electricity, all things energy. Uh, we've had no shortage of volatility there over the last few months, so they've got a lot of great information. I'll pass it over to you guys now. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy crazy week in the markets. Crazy month. Um, good morning, Mike. Hey, Mike Korn is joining me. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, it was nice to uh, be able to do the show together from our, your office. Last yeah. week. Back back to, yeah. you know, the video chat. So let's let's um, let's get to it really quick because the crude number just came out and then and then we can dive into some of, you know, our more deep analysis. Um, so, I mean, the neck ass number, I guess I crude on the brain. Um, so the neck ass storage number came out, the market, and when I say the market, I mean the futures, the trade, um, was expecting a draw of 140, and the number was 141. So generally, I think I've talked about this before, those, those futures are pretty accurate except for like kind of the start of, of each new season as models get calibrated. Um, but you know, you can imagine that everybody out there that has all of um, their special models that they run, whether it's services or their own kind of proprietary models, they're trading that. Um, and even though it's not a lot of volume, the trades in the contract, all, all it takes is to make a two way on the screen and and you get the contract to settle where you want it to. So so that tends to be pretty efficient. And you know, I gave up long ago trying to you know waste any of my time on on forecasting those numbers because it's like you have a free forecasting model for yourself. And anyone who doesn't know that contract symbol is EIW, um, and they do three weekly um, futures for the next upcoming three weeks, and they're listed by expiration date rather than week ending date. So sometimes that causes a little confusion, like today's was listed with, you know, 1220 expiration date, even though it's for week ending December 14th. Um, you know, same story, uh, the lower chart um, in the lower right, the green bar is 2018 current inventory levels. Um, and you can kind of see I drew a line and extended it back all the way to 2012. Um, no, no big difference there. You know, same story. We're, we're below in inventory levels. The thing to note though, is if you look at the comps up here in the upper right, we're starting to get into, um, some years where end of December and January draws were fairly significant. Um, you can see in 2013 for this week, we drew almost 269. And, you know, that might be kind of dissuading, but for the fact that our, our levels are so much lower than all of these other years. So, you know, I guess you could say, I guess it's a good thing. It would, might be a little more dangerous if we, if we had comparable draws to, um, 2016 and 2013 years. Um, so this is what uh, this chart is looking at the EIA storage futures. I like to put this together every day. Starting from left to right, you can see current inventory levels before the number came out compared to the same week last year and the five-year average. And then listing the three Futures contracts today, you can see in green, the 141 mark futures settled last night at 140. Next week, it looks, next two weeks actually look are very small. I mean, the weather is pretty mild and holiday weeks are just a bear um, when, it, when it comes to demand. Um, and then there's an end of draw. So April ending storage futures contract, the trades, yeah, you know, it's a bit of conjecture and nonsense at the moment, but it settled last night at 1377, which is higher than, you know, where we ended this last winter at. So we'll get into kind of talking about some of that in a little bit. Um, quick stats, just taking a look at winter to date. So 
starting at the beginning of the winter storage injection season through now, I think it's, I keep forgetting to know my exact, I think it's been five weeks. Um, you can see the cumulative storage draws by year for this same week. We had been running neck and neck with um, our big analog year, which was 2013, 14, until this week when, when they definitely jumped ahead. Um, and so that brought up the weekly average to, and, and then I'm looking at the yellow bar um, and to, on the top, 99 weekly average withdrawal in the 2013, 14 season, kind of a bit more average in, in all the next four years, five years around 50, 55. And then we're obviously ahead of average this year at 72.50. So those are the stats. And now uh, Mike and I want to just do a little bit deeper dive and take a look at demand, uh, inventory, and cash prices. And from the standpoint of you know, there's a lot of interesting analysis and, and, and data points to pivot off of for this up uh, for January expiration and then just the month of January in and of itself. And, you know, I, overall, when I, you know, you can look at this data all you want and, you know, it continues to be a sort of bullish narrative, but don't let, you know, don't get caught up in, um, you know, mistiming that, you know, depending on what levels we are at, at the end of December, how January the contract expires, most ETFs, I think all of them that are natural gas focused have all rolled to the February contract. So except for the expectation that whatever January does, it will drag Feb along with it. You, you, you know, you, you just got to make sure you know what you're looking at on the screens um, if you're trading some of these ETFs instead of the outright futures. So I know there's a lot going on here on, on this next slide. Um, and Mike, I'm going to rely on you to if I'm you know missing or not explaining some part of it. Right. Um, hopefully you can kind of you're always good at, at jumping in on that. OK, so, appreciate that. I'm with you. So there. So there's some weather services out there that project, well, here, let's set it up overall. This, the theme of this overall slide is January. And I'm really looking at, in prior years, how much did we take out of storage in January? Um, what did total gas consumption look like? And that's kind of that whole ta table on the right from EIA's website, they always post, um, you, know, you can see by month, total net gas consumption, and then kind of looking at how that correlated. So starting from left to right, I, I have January storage withdrawals by year. Um, our big years were 2014 and 2018, where we withdrew for the month of January and give or take, you know, you got to play with the days. So, but all of these reflect 28 days. Um, and, and we had some big 900 draw months, um, which, which were very big. And, th and those were fairly um, bullish years. Although interesting, you know, of the last six or so plus seven years, maybe even more, um, well, definitely more. Last, this January 18, we actually had the largest draw on record. And I know it seems like hard to remember, but January on the East Coast set a lot of records um, for how cold it was. And, and so I thought it's it, just to get your mind around this, in 2018, kind of demand is expressed as heating degree days, which is HDD we observed 947 heating degree days. So demand days for natural gas. The forecast for 2019 is 970. And you know, you can extrapolate that any way you want. There are a lot of people who wanna do the supply comparisons or the supply arguments. And 
for me, you know, who's to say, um, I, you know, I can only focus on, on the things, you know, um, and, and, and not the things that are conjecture. And, and I think, you know, excess production, there's history. And then there is, what does that look like in the winter? So, so if you, if you want to live on that side of the equation and, and all you're focused on is supply, you know, you're probably, you know, I, 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 I think that's not going to serve you well in that so much of it is down south and not on the east, not in the demand centers. And Henry Hub tends to be a clearing, you know, index for supply versus demand centers. Um, and, and we'll take a look at that on, on some price charts here going forward. Um, and so I looked at, you can see the red bar for 2019. I took the five-year average and said, all right, so let's say that was what we withdrew. Um, if you remember on this slide, you know, you can see what the next couple weeks futures look like for weekly draws. Um, and so I just used 140 and 50, so 190, and took us to 2725 at the end of December in, in the ground. Um, and if you took the five year average, so 760 off of that, you're under, you know, to be, you know, two, one, you know, 2.0, almost 1.9. And, and relative to other years, um, you can see the inventory level. Oops. I think I've got a lot of data going on here, but in the gray boxes, I've referenced where inventory levels were for some of these years um, at the end of January. So for example, in 2016, we were at 2.9. In 2014, we were at 1.92. If we draw the five-year average this year in January, we're at 1.96. Um, if we draw 900, we're at 1.8. So either way you look at it, um, it it's a, it, it has a potential to be a dire situation if any of these demand forecasts show up. Um, you know, you can produce all the gas you want in even in Appalachian region and and especially down in Texas, and you're you don't you're not going to get it to California or to New England, and and so those prices, you know, they're going to do you know go crazy if if this weather materializes in those you know kind of localized areas the question always becomes how does henry hub react to that you know there've been days where new england cash prices are trading $200 and henry hub is 6 um you know because if you can't get it there you can't get it there but it certainly does pull any molecule that could get there in, in that direction. Um, what I find tends to impact Henry Hub a little bit more on some of those days is the mid-continent. And I think last year we had, it was up in kind of the Ventura, you know, the mid Chicago, Illinois, kind of Minnesota, Nebraska area. There were some pipeline issues and, and prices at the end of, De I think it was the end of December, you know, went up to a hundred and some dollars, <laughs> you know, like something that would be considered like a, a power price an electricity next day price, not a gas price. And that, and that really um, had an effect on Henry hub. So, so it, it matters where this forecast is going to hit. You know, if all of this demand is coming from the southern region, it's not as big of a problem as if it's coming, you know, from, you know, east, west, and mid-continent. And just, you know, for a note, take forecasts for what they are. February in 2018, we observed 693 heating degree days. The current forecast for February is um, 821. So... If you want to make a bullish case, 
you can make one um, by translating that into the market during holidays. It just, it, it really sucks. So, um, you know, I think it's really, it's good to get all of kind of this background and data in your arsenal so that, that you're ready um, and you can put some structures on that kind of get you set up for um, what could happen. And, and right now, really, time is running out. There's only, I think, six days left on January options. Yeah, and right. right, seven till the futures expire. So, so you're really looking at February. And, um, you know, last year, the weather moderated so much from January to February. This year, that's, you know, not the forecast, but <laughs> what, what are you going to do with that, right? You kind of got to wait for it to show up. So one thing I've noticed, this next slide, I've been taking a look at kind of the last few years where cash, where the average of all the daily cash prices, so next day gas, where, where that averaged out, or you could say priced out, versus where futures are trading for January 19. And, and I think it's funny, and, and I know all markets do this, right? They kind of look to history to, you know, kind of place their bets on the roulette wheel and, and gravitate towards, you know, historical levels. Um, you can see Henry Hub in the middle last year, even with that, you know, strong weather scenario that we had in January, we had much higher inventory levels at the time. And day, the average of, of all the daily cash prices was 371. And I mean, uh, it'll be, I wouldn't be surprised to see us, you know, just bounce around that area um, and, until expiration, you know, if somebody has, has some ax to grind. Um, Otherwise, people will just go to delivery at that level. I think we talked about that last week. December expiration got so crazy. And on this chart, we took a look at the dark blue line is where December first of month index or you know futures, you can call it expired. And the light blue line and the green line are where it's priced out and is pricing out. So been quite a letdown. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, if January is expiration is, is going to be the fireworks month. I'm not saying it couldn't be, but, um, you know, people might prefer to, you know, sell the month and buy the dailies going into, into January. Um, I'd certainly do that. There's a lot, um, well, depending on what level January expires at, but there's a lot more potential for, for that cash to price out if, if this um, inventory level comes in. So anyway, really back to the side, you know, kind of Rockies area, Lady Hub is the Appalachian region. Um, then you've got Henry Hub and then you've got your New England, um, two New England regions. And you can see that's really last year is kind of the salmon or light orange line how strongly the east coast priced out in january um algonquin and tetco algonquin averaged almost 16 dollars tetco um which is you know the east side of new jersey around 13 a little almost 13 29 so people are not for earlier january futures at those locations had been bid up quite a bit more um, but after what happened this month in, if we take a look at Algonquin, you know, people were pretty optimistic paying 10, over 10 bucks at expiration and, you know, it's pricing out, it's going to price out to six. I mean, we still have some days to go, but so they're a little gun shy going into um, this next month. But that could all, you know, the last couple of days, things could really change. The, you know, January and February have absolutely the most risk premium built into them on all of these basis locations. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a lot going on away from the hub um, as far as positioning coming into the beginning of the month. And 
And and I mean, I mean, I know you saw that this past January, right? When Mike, when all of a sudden you saw the cash prices just going crazy. Yeah. Around. Mm -hmm. So um, just to give you a feel for that cash price action, I, I like to kind of carve out the overall gas system by you know, east and west and mid-continent. And this particular slide is just taking a look at Henry Hub, um, you know, and, and moving north and then to the west. So to the, you know, the western demand centers. And, and you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Henry Hub is the black line on this chart. Fairly constant. Um, this start is from November 1st and every day through December 20th, the balance of the month, and then January swing futures, which is at the moment basically equivalent to January futures. Um, and you can see Henry Hub and, and really Chicago and Rockies, which have really good pipeline systems and movement of gas in and out and around throughout those systems, trading really the spread between them is the cost of transportation all month. It's really, you know, on the bottom half here, you have your production centers. So Waha and Permian, right? These are down here in, in the Permian Basin. And then ACO, which is in Canada, right? And that is their production region. And, and they're really constrained by takeaway capacity. Um, and, you know, as, if, as they're attempting to get to market, they're, you know, having to pay so much to get on this, you know, whatever space they can on, on you know, whatever pipeline space is available. So their, their net back or what they're receiving, uh, you know, as a discount to Henry Hub is pretty significant. I mean, you know, we see some below a dollar levels here. To, you know, over Thanksgiving, we saw, you know, that, oh, that whole little group uh, get below a um, dollar or close. Yeah, definitely below. And I, and I think even on this day, there were some anecdotes of negative prices for cash on those days. And, you know, it can be so confusing, right? Because you're sitting there look, hearing stories about negative prices in the Permian and in Canada. Meanwhile, you're over here looking at PG&E, which is the green line, and SoCal, which is the hot pink line, and those are demand centers, um, pricing at you know almost close seven and eight dollars. Meanwhile, Henry Hub just kind of meanders along in between and generally gets impacted by. You can see the demand kind of came off and prices came off here um, on the, out in California. And, and that ultimately sort of pushed down Henry Hub prices and you know, nothing's really happening in, in these production regions in the Permian, um, just waiting for pipelines. And, and that's going to be the story I think, until the end of next year. So anyway, I like looking at and, and the same if you were to look at the East Coast, things would be similar. However, a year ago, the production centers in uh, the Appalachian region were kind of re receiving the same discounts as the Permian to Henry Hub, but they've expanded their takeaway capacity and now are like if you look at Dominion South, it's receiving you know it it, it look it's very tight to Henry Hub and and that's just a reflection of being able to get the gas to that market, but on the Demand center sides, you have um, Algonquin and Tetco, and and those have been spiking way up. So so very similar, um, and I would say that there are more forces of demand centers on the upside than there are you know pulls from supply centers, especially since it's really now a Texas story. So. You know, you, I think those stories are interesting when you hear them and, and you know, media and whatnot like to make, you know, headlines of negative prices and, and low prices. 
I'm just saying you, you have to take it in context of the overall picture. I mean, it really, it, it represents potential for the future, but not potential right now. Um, they're not going to put it on a truck and drive it out to uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> and even LNG with the Jones Act, um, you're, you know, it's just, you're not going to get it to the East Coast. So, you know, the hope is for that gas to go to Mexico and, and go overseas. And, and really what it represents is, you know, potential capacity. And, and it's always good to keep that in mind, but it doesn't really have a lot to do with the price of what do they say the price of tea in China is that the saying? <laughs> yeah. Bryn, by the way, I just wanted to point out uh, that chart is really a good big picture of what you're describing, and for me, looking at it, it's really uh, easy to look at. It's chart is visual art. I really like that slide. It tells a great picture. It shows a great picture. Well, thanks. You know, it's funny. I gotten in the habit now of putting maps on my charts with with kind of colors on the blocks that match my lines because i i've discovered that you know there are just so many people that have they they don't know what i'm referencing right and when, when i'm you know listing all of these different price points and you know i, I like to make a chart effective <laughs> so yeah and I, and, I, and I like to put maps on it and even arrows of some of the directions of, of you know where gas might flow right can can i ask you this so since last week like every day you're seeing one day up 20 in the actual next day down 25 next day up 20 and, and so on and i saw you had re replied on the chat about volatility and i liked your comment that winter isn't over so i was wondering do you think we could see a big run in the short term for natural if temps uh, you know, uh, come in as expected? That's a, that's a great question, Mike. So let's look at this slide, which is power demand. And, and, and this might highlight the challenge that we're facing. Um, people are for sure bullish, um, but you know, you cash prices are, you know, they started the month. That's great. You know, you can kind of reflect demand. You know, there's no holiday. And now here we are just like the last week of Thanksgiving with this couple holiday weeks coming up. Um, and I think that's driving a lot of this volatility that we're seeing. And by this volatility, I mean, I'm not talking the initial run where we, you know, finally made a move to reflect some of these overall bullish narratives mm. and you get there and you got to sit around and twiddle your thumbs and wait for the next thing and, and slog through some really messy demand days. So, you know, I think that's what explains that we're up 20, up 50, down 50. I don't take it as an erosion of the, narrative. I mean, we have gas in the ground. There is no shortage of gas today. It is how valuable is it to people in the future or today? And, and, and it gets a little less valuable when you go through these you know, milder days in the winter and, and it takes kind of getting back into, you know, seeing the forecast in your next week window to get everybody to get on board again. Um, and certainly swings like we've had this week, you know, they, they hurt a lot of people, right? And, and people, you know, they, they get in and, and the market's swinging all over the place. You know, it's just, I, I, I don't like to trade fix price, you know, outright you know, during these times. Now it's a different story. Prices are lower, right? Or different, but you know what? We've made these big moves and, and implied volatility is high. So I expect this type of variability and we've been testing the 50 day and the hundred day kind of playing around, settling in. Maybe we're gonna around this 370 area 
roll January off the board, however it does. And, and then if we see you know, it come back from after Christmas and, and you can really take a look at a forecast that, that sh, you know, has within the window some real seasonally below temperatures, that, that's when we're going to start to see everybody kind of hoard their inventory and, and not let it go for, you know, just your everyday price in the three to four dollar range, right, if that makes sense. And on this slide, I like to look at, and I, I think I've shown this before, it's PJM Power Pool, and it's the daily demand forecast. So there's a futures contract that where the power pool predict does a forecast of you know the next five or seven days of their load based on historicals and weather forecasts, and then you know clears against you know what the actual peak load, peak load for the day, peak demand. And in the white kind of outlined here is where peak load was last year. And, you know, I mean, living out here on the East Coast tomorrow, it's going to be a high of 61. And you can certainly see that reflected, you know, in this demand area. And, and then we're just coming into the weekend and we have Christmas. And, and look, you, you can't dismiss the fact that power is sort of a swing or inter incremental buyer of natural gas. Of course, priority goes to LDCs, um, to serving customer load, but next in line is power gen. Um, and at high prices, you know, they tend to make other decisions at lower prices. They, they tend to be more interested in gas, especially because when prices are lower, it generally means there's pipeline capacity. So many of these power generators do not have firm transport into their systems especially on the East Coast. So they are at the mercy of deliverability. Um, I mean, I even know there's, you know, small utilities out in New England really are just hooked up to their LDC. And if gas is there, they'll, they'll generate. If it's not, the, you know, then they have to go to their secondary fuel source. And, and generally out here, it's fuel oil. So, you know, I... I would expect us to be weak uh, as we go through, you know, uh, this weekend and next week. But I'm, you know, I'm bull I I'm expecting to, you know, place, you know, various structures on and, you know, with, you know, to get exposure to the upside should it happen. But I, I, I'm just, I expect us to look weak during, during the next, you know, seven or so days, even, you know, maybe expiration changes that. Um, but I will not be surprised if um, people run in and start buying it. I mean, it, it's just because the next seven, I, I think, I, I think I heard Rick Santelli say the other day on TV, just because it's warm in January doesn't mean it's spring. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, just because it's warm, right now and I mean that's all relative right I'm sitting out here on the east coast and you know 61 degrees at Christmas is uh, pretty pretty I, I'd call it warm I know you guys down in Florida have a different <laughs> definition of that but well if the natural gas contract was on the Chicago Merc years ago we'd never see high prices because it's always spring there right uh, well yeah. yeah well lately right yeah uh, um yeah, you know, it's funny. I remember, um, was it in 2000, 2001? Uh, I'd refer, it was the first time I'd moved to the East Coast. I was living in Connecticut and, and trading East Coast electricity. Prior to that, I had been in Houston trading electricity, Also, but I, but I focused on East Coast region. And I found it so, I, I felt like I had an advantage living on the East Coast, yeah. you know, running up prices over, you know, 4th of July. And I was wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. Right, <laughs> that's not I, cold. That... I knew that that uh, it was not, you know, not new. But I felt like I had an advantage. I mean, you're, it's so hot in Texas. Of course, if, you know, they tell you it's going to be hot. You feel it, right? Yeah. But I, I almost felt like I had, you know, because I I could 
I you know, knew that wearing jeans and a sweatshirt um, and having a bonfire outside on the 4th of July was not, not going to realize uh, the weekly and daily prices that, that were being traded at the time. And, and I can't remember a couple hundred dollars or something um, what those levels were, but it's, it's always interesting when you're trading some of these, you know, localized products, it, it is good to, you know, have some feet on the ground, yeah. <laughs> a satellite office or live there. But I, you know, it's December and I know winter's coming. Like I've seen the forecasts. I don't really want them to be true, you know, just from a personal comfort standpoint, but I kind of also like them to materialize from a market excitement <laughs> side of the, of the coin. Um, so here's uh, moving in next to it. And we're going to get to crude oil too. Let's see what time it was. Maybe I have to move. Oh, we're good. Okay. Um, so looking at that was the cash markets and taking you know what we looked at what January could look like from inventory withdrawals, what prices you know in different months or years with different draw levels have you know how prices have actualized, and then where futures are you know for January are trading. And now I, I mean, look, I just want to take a look a little bit further, you know, and, and look at the 12 month strip uh, futures curves. And I, I like to take, I like to look at Henry Hub, um, which is in the green. The purple is up in the Appalachian Utica region. And the blue is the Waha Permian area. And, you know, I, we can talk all we want about winter. And look at this April, last night, April Waha futures, if you apply it, you know, through basis is just a hair above 50 cents. So that if you're wanting, you know, to think about how do you play that, you know, keep your eye on, on those producers that are heavily focused in that area. And yet for most of them, you know, the reason that these prices are just so low and meaningless is because most of the production down there is coming from oil produce, you know, oil production and, and they're factoring in essentially zero. Um, you know, they're, they're counting on getting their cash flow from oil, which isn't looking as good recently. You know, if, if you were, I mean, to be honest with you this whole year, as we watch crude oil prices run up, no, those producers, they didn't, they didn't care about what was happening to prices, um, you know, to their associated gas prices. But now I imagine. Yeah, they were all very bullish at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, people um, I speak to, yeah. Well, bullish natural gas or bullish oil? Uh, bullish oil. So, yeah. Yeah, bullish natural was all, our, if we ever get above $3, we'll be bullish. And then it went from. The struggle to get above three, as you know, to what uh, four eighty or so. Hey, Mike, you know, I know you you see you do a lot of business with producers looking to hedge oil. Do you yeah. see much of that in natural gas, just in in your world? Yeah, um, this week I haven't seen anything related to winter. Uh, the, uh, one small first quarter strip, but uh, the interest I'm seeing so far this week in natural is really summer 19, April through Oc. And uh, the flow I'm seeing, I'm, I'm not very active, but I'm, I'm pricing a number of things. I uh, just want to distinguish between executing and, and getting markets, yeah. But uh, I've been looking at- At fences? The, yeah, uh, fences. So with the summer uh, a little bit below 285 for that strip, I think yeah. that it's offered at uh, 284. Right, trading right about 284 today. Um, I've been looking at puts that are very close to the money, like the 275 put and the 265 put with call strikes. Uh, at what, that three and a quarter? Make buying or? the puts on the call costless. And those call strikes are very close to at the money. So those structures have very high deltas. So that's probably the reason why people aren't doing them. But there's definitely producer interest in April, October, as you're pointing out. Yeah, and and I had, you know, or way or this past summer in some of you know my initial uh, presentations, I had 
done a dive into some of the producer 10Ks and their hedging reports. And it looked like for 2018, most of them were kind of in the 250, three and a quarter fence, right? And we just never really got above that three and a quarter. You know, we had the excitement in January, but for the rest of the year, we, you know, we were just staying right in that range. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that it, when, when prices, you know, are trading kind of inside of a producer's insurance, there's no, there's no noise. But then once you break above that, and, and we saw it when it happened in crude, because so many of them had their upside strike in 2019, I believe it was 58 was their call strike. And yeah, so and I kind of, if I could just interject, I, I yeah. think that sounds right from what I remember, that call strike being about the time uh, Mexico was coming in and hedging uh, the, the summer before in 17 yeah. and 18 also, the strike may have been a little bit higher, but that's kind of the put strike, or sorry, that's the call strike I kind of recall when the 45 to 50 puts were active with the market in that early stages of the rally. Well, and, you know, for, for a lot of the year, crude was kind of within that nice range, but it was really yeah. interesting. If you go back and look at a chart of what crude did once it really blew through that $58 level, because here's the thing. So if you're a producer and, and you put on a structure, you know, where you buy a put and you sell a call, everything is fine if you're within that range. The minute the market moves above your call strike and stays there, and, and not just by a few pennies. I mean, we saw crude go all the way up to $70, right? Number one, you, you're getting called away right. at 50 left in crude 58 in natural gas, it would have been three and a quarter. Um, and if the market runs significantly higher, I mean, you need to kind of goose your cash flow and goose your bottom line, right? You have to have some exposure to that market move and, and people tend to, you know, they have to produce more. Um, they, maybe they don't, you know, it's too difficult to get any more on the market and they're being called away at these lower prices. So then they jump in and maybe want to buy it back. And they always buy it back at the wrong time. And that's when things kind of start to get a little interesting on the upside. And, and we didn't really see that until this last run up in natural gas. When we, if you look at kind of what the price action was, once we got above three and a quarter, because that's where the 2018 hedge levels were. 2019, I, I'll have, you know, I suppose they're setting a lot of them now, Mike, with looking at um, summer strips. And they don't really like, maybe they'll do a cow, but it, it, it seems like the summer is, is really what they're worried about. Yeah, right here, just in this last week, that's what I'm seeing in the natural. Yeah, at this time of year, right? Producers always yeah. wait for some move up in the winter strip in hopes that it moves the summer strip up a little bit and, yeah. and they can set those fences, right? The put call cost list hedge at, at a little bit higher levels. And, and the market is just completely unwilling to move that summer strip and let them do that. Yeah, I don't have a, an April, October uh, strip chart in front of me, but I kind of, do you remember what the high in summer 19 was? I think it got to $3 when we were at the top in the first quarter when we were 470, 480. I'm trying to remember. Oh, at but the actually, beginning of the year? Yeah, I'd have to, I, that's a good question. I'd have yeah. To, I don't remember getting, I think I remember seeing a three handle, but I don't remember it being much over $3. And again, right now we're a little bit below 285. Yeah. And, you know, at the beginning of the year, I don't know how many of them, you know, they tend to more look at putting those hedges on at the end, right, yeah. of, of the year going into the next trip. But yeah, it may have. I mean, it, it's, it's dead money. Yeah. I mean, you can buy that and you can park money in the summer and, you know, it's going to move five or 10 cents in, until we get there. Yeah, I think um, that May straddle is still right about 40 cents or so. I haven't closely looked at it, but we spoke last week. That was about the same level. So things have not moved back there all that dramatically in terms of price or vowel. And it's not going to um, yet. 
And then, you know, who knows, summer is a whole different animal. But what I would say is that just because the summer is not getting dragged up with the winter doesn't mean that's bearish. It, it just means that, you know, the market is just not letting anyone in to these hedges. And for the last five years, we've trained, we traded in, in that 250 to three and a quarter range you know, but for, I think, what was it 2015 when we went below $2. So there, there's just that you're not going to get any movement out of that until you get kind of even probably Feb off the board and into March. And then all of a sudden April makes its run because that's a maintenance month for power plants. And, and that, gets to set the tone for the rest of the summer. So, you know, it's, it's kind of seems like a safe place at the moment. And, and, and you see people kind of move money into the summer when they're getting out of the front, they're just parking it there. And then they move it back in, into the front, into the winter when, when, you know, they see like they could move back into this, to the summer as we had to go through this week and next week, and then and then you'll see that kind of reverse. Uh, let's see here. So here's the all the way out to 2021 Henry Hub futures curve, and and I know you deal a lot, Mike, with quotes and and people looking at these cow strips. Yeah. Um, it's a way for them to smooth out that winter shape of the curve. Um, but I found it interesting. The dotted line is beginning of the year. So it's where the strip was on January 2nd. And the, the solid line is as of last night. And the front, all the way through maybe 2020, right? The curve pulled itself up. But right. once you get to summer 2020, it's like lower um, by 20 to 30 cents than it was at the beginning of the year. So I think that's your comment here, right? That summer, um, so here was here was where summer, these strips were, so summer 19 on January 2nd. It could have moved higher than that, but it doesn't look like it got up to three. Um, but maybe you were thinking about the summer 20. That mm. looks like it, it got yeah. close, the Spudding April off. Part. Yeah. So anyway, even this, you know, move in the front, it just, you know, you, you can't, it's like pulling teeth to get anyone um, interested in the back of this market. And, and especially with the, the excitement in the story was how many coal plants are retiring and this shiny new customer that natural gas got for itself, right, in, in these power plants. And, and then all of a sudden, renewables kind of got their foot in the door and, 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 and it's, you know, electricity demand is not a growing sector. People, you know, they'll, it's always focused on um, consumption reduction. And so, you know, the whole time they were getting this brand spanking new customer is like, I mean, sure you're supplying a, gro a sector that's not growing. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm not sure that has necessarily materialized the way everybody expected. So I, I know we're, we only have, we're running out of time and I, and I wanna get to some comments on the crude oil market. You know, it's been talked to death, the inventories and the numbers, and, and I don't wanna go into all of that. It, you know, kind of, it's obvious it is what it is. Um, you, know, you can do all the forecasts or imports, exports, all of that stuff. You know, but the overall narrative in the markets is this extreme bearishness. And, you know, it's the narrative is sort of following the price action, which has been severe. And whenever things like that happen in the market, I kind of like to look for evidence of that narrative. And, and so I try to come at it in different ways. And really what I wanted to do here is kind of give you another way to look at it. And, and is, is, it, is it what you know, everybody is telling you from a supply glut standpoint? So this first slide, I took a look at the chart of the 12 month 
spread. So Feb 19 to Feb 20. And I looked at where that spread was at the end of last year. So around 250 and where that spread is as of last night. So negative 250. So we've moved $5. So from backwardation to contango. And then I compare it to inventory levels. So the black is where inventory levels were at the end of last year. And the green is where they were as of yesterday's report. And, you know, if you were looking at a $5 move from backwardation to contango, you think you could, you know, take a look at your inventory levels and you would see just this massive difference between this year and last year. I mean, I know I'm simplifying it, but you know, for lack of time, right? I'm just kind of trying to get it out, right? If you look at sort of across the board, crude, Cushing, gasoline, distillate, we're all a little and overall the same or a little bit lower than, than where we were at this time last year. And you know, I, I don't think that points out a glut per se relative to the market being in backwardation at this time last year. And, and then another way I wanted to come at this was I took a look at the chart of December 19 futures and the December 19 WTI Brent spread. And you can see that, you know, obviously everybody's felt this, lived it every day, right? The 70 plus all the way down to below $50 where we are right now. And yet, for the most part, this WTI Brent spread has really stayed in a, a range for most of the year. And, you know, I, I like to look at that spread as maybe a demand indicator. You know, if, if that spread widens out, it kind of says, you know, there's a lot of excess supply over here relative to where it's needed. And if the spread kind of narrows in and vice versa, I mean, depending on price levels, right? But you know, you're not really seeing a lot of movement in the outright spread. So we're not really seeing you know, evidence of comp comparables on inventory levels. We're not seeing uh, benchmark future spreads really make the same sort of price move that outright futures have. And then, you know, you look at heating oil. So WTI futures versus heating oil. And, you know, so if anything, cracks have widened out, right? Which is not generally a story of low demand or a glut. Um, it, it's maybe a reflection, I suppose you could say of, um, refining capacity, right? It's like LNG. We only have X amount of capacity to liquefy natural gas. So we only have X amount of refining capacity. So I guess it's placing a premium on that option. But I take a look at this in these ways because number one, we've, everybody's heard everything else. And number two, I, uh, ask yourself, are you, especially at these levels, are you bearish because of a supply story or, or is the bearish narrative from here almost a signal of recession and it's pre-signaling that, right? So if, so if you're in the recession camp, it almost seems like that is what oil is reacting to as a precursor. And, and imagine if, we don't get stocks next year, equities to follow, then, you know, uh, we're, I'd expect us to turn right back around. So be careful here at these levels. I, I don't think that it's as clear cut and it's always difficult to position on sentiments and narratives because they can turn pretty quickly as, as we saw when we were up above 70 plus dollars. That was sentiment as well, right? That, that the market was going, uh, there are certain conditions were gonna happen and, and we were gonna be undersupplied. So from there with that setup, Mike, you kind of took a look at some of the options in, in WTI 
for the February contract. Yeah, if you can, before I do, I just wanted to reinforce what you're saying about the Brent TI, uh, the Brent Feb March time spread. Feb is about 33 cents under March. Same with WTI, the Feb is 33 cents under March. Highlighting just how steady the Brent TI has been. Yeah, you know, there's a, not even really much play in the Brent TI box, right? Yeah. Which gets kind of popular when, when you know, one relative to another month blows out. It, it's just yeah. been fairly stable. Yeah. The, um, but you, looking at the options uh, slide you put up, thanks for doing that. That was... Uh, probably from about an hour and a half ago when you put that together at the time February was 45 cents higher. Uh, but the, I can tell you what the option premiums are in a second. Uh, but that, that slide, I think shows a picture about options pretty well. I just wanted to update the premium real quickly. The 44 put right now has rallied to $1.55 from $1.39. And the 50 call has dropped from 139 to 104. But again, with you could still see that the call, first of all, both at the time I did the slide, both the put and the call were the same distance out of the money. They both have 32 deltas. And you could see the difference in premium really is based on volatility, uh, the put being higher there. And uh, 27 days to expire. The reason I was thinking about this, because when we spoke earlier, before we're discussing things here, I was wondering, does it make sense if it's not smart to be so bearish now under 50? You know, will some people look at this uh, as cheap levels? Does it make sense to kind of be a little bit of a contrarian and look for calls? And that's when I looked at the $50 calls at $1.18. Um, and so I just wanted your opinion on that. Uh, and we kind of discussed that, you know, maybe that call not so far of the money maybe it's not so good because right now even with 27 days to go there's not a lot of great performance with calls here so i'm not yeah, sure if that's ball is, implied yeah. ball is yeah running fairly high i mean in oil for the last couple months which yeah kind of was surprising that it sustained and it makes me more interested in further out on the curve Okay. I feel like um, that or time spreads. Right. Or I would just, uh, one, one more alternative staying with this option. Um, if you wait out to maybe 16, 17 days, and that's a, a kind of an indirect shout out to XDMA, uh, what he was looking at, the Jan options with about that much time. It'll be ah. interesting to see if we don't move that much from these future levels uh, uh, in the next week or so given the holidays and that time decay that, uh, you know, there's extra time decay naturally. Um, I'm wondering if you'll be able to pick up the same call, maybe an equivalent strike price if the futures moved, but buying a strike that has a delta of 32, but only paying 40 cents or so for it, doing it at 16 or 17 days out instead of here, because I could, it, it's, it, there's a good chance the market won't have some great movements right now as we come into the holidays and so much news has been played out so far. Right. And, you know, um, I was actually yesterday, if, if it wasn't this holiday coming up, the at the monies have been running, the straddles have been running above $5. Yeah. And, you know, uh, of course, that's probably a good sale. And, and you get to buy some of the wings back. Uh, yeah. you know, you, you, we decay all of this time next week. Um, and, and the vol, I, I, I just can't, I, I can't imagine vol going up at, no. it, it's like with natural gas, it's always got a call skew versus a put skew because everybody believes natural gas is sitting at rock bottom prices all the time, right? right, or wrong, right? That's what they believe. And, and that's kind of what this tells me here, right? People are just the puts, I, I tell you what, that there's there's not much action going on in these options. They're too. Right. How much more downside are you going to get? And they're not cheap. Right, and that that's that leads me to wait. So should I look to be buying that fifty call? If we could keep the slide, I look to hopefully next week 
see where we are and see how those dynamics have changed at all? Well, that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, certainly um, if we don't get some big price move, the, imagine to see the ball erode, right? Yeah. That, yeah. That's a great idea. Um, I'll keep it and, and we'll cool. comp next week. Maybe that'll give us a, a little bit more of a running narrative on that. It, it's hard because there's just, um, I, I would say I would be more inclined to want to own crude, but you know, I, who wants to get chopped up in this year end? You, you, you're you still uh, suggesting to look further back that you were suggesting earlier because of that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, I know we're, we thanks some thanks to um, opportunistic trader. They gave us a whole hour today and I don't want to take any more advantage of that. We're right on the hour. Um, Thank you. Opportunistic I, trader. I, I, I definitely, I welcome any feedback from from people. I would say that I always tend to think about ways to give people knowledge that they can kind of put away in 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 their you know tool chest, so that when a lot of these different market moves happen, or when you're seeing different stories out there, you have um, another way to look at it. It's more like I'll teach you to fish. <laughs> yeah. Right. So hope I, 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 you know, Mike and I are definitely wide open to any, um, you know, suggestions that people had have um, regarding, you know, what, what you'd like to see. So thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Merry new year. As we used to yeah, say, Merry before. Christmas. I don't know if there are people around next Thursday. Um, uh, you know, the question should be, should we be around? Right, right. Good, good, right take well, a nice little holiday. Have, you know, yeah. Be safe. Don't, don't ruin your Christmas with stupid trades. <laughs> right on. All right. Thanks, Bryn. Thanks, Mike.